my main point here is that none of us should get into this dialogue of my slave master was better than your slave master in as much as all of them were bad. But each one of us had to deal with a given situation. And all of the situations were bad. And all of the situations were humiliating. And none of the slave masters were kind. And none of them did us any favor. And none of them favored one over the other. And understand that the slave ships did not bring any black Americans or any Caribbeans out of Africa. Well, only African people. And all of them had to become what the system made them become. And so we have to understand that all of us belong to a collective African family away from home. And subsequently, we are going to have to go back home or make some kind of contribution to Africans in Africa. All right, that's not my point. That's not the subject for tonight, but it is a subject that we cannot avoid. All right, now, why the emphasis on Africa and the rise of Christianity and I'll tell you how I came to the subject briefly. Because I learned to read very early because I wanted to teach Sunday school in a Baptist church. And because I had I was under the persuasion of a great lady, my great grandmother, one of the great loves of my existence, because she was devoutly religious and a believer in the Bible to the point of saying everything in the Bible is true and not to be contradicted. And when I found all those white images, and went to grandma. Grandma said, shut up, boy. That's God's word. When I mentioned the curse and asked the question, what did we do as a people to get curse? She rationalized it and said that, well, one day the veil will be lifted and we'll be freed of the curse. I could not deal with this because I had so much faith in her and her deep religious belief that everything in the Bible was true. I had not grown up, of course. I had not read books about how the Bible got written. I did not know at that time how to separate history from Jewish folklore. I did not know that principally the Bible is a Jewish survival book and a very good one, and that some of it is pure history, some of it is pure folklore, but all of it is spirituality, and we must understand, all of it was told as a spiritual story and for the spiritual enhancement of all men. I had not at that time looked at the Egyptian version and the Ethiopian version of the Bible. It was not until the late 30s that I saw an Ethiopian Bible and in the Ethiopian Bible, there was only one white character, and that was the devil. <laughs> I had not at that time been exposed to 
all of that are the literature concerning the religions of the world. I saw that Africa was the basis of all the three major world religions. But I want to look at, I want to look at not only Africa as the basis of the world's religion, I want to look at the spirituality of the world of that day before the formal development of these religions. Because these religions were developed out of the spirituality that existed at the time. And that the spirituality at the time and the religions at the time was not a weekend thing. It was an all-conclusive thing that it embraced the life of its inheritance. To such an extent, your religion determined your dress, your marriage, your diet, it determined where you lived, it determined the totality of your life. And it was not a partial thing in your life, it was a total thing in your life as your choice of spirituality supposed to be. Western man made it something that it was never intended to be. Now, my main point is that all of the elements that went into the making of the world's three major religions, Christianity, I mean Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all of the elements existed in Africa 3,000 years before the formal development of these religions. We want to look at these elements and look at these stories that we want to deal with the Hebrew entry and to what extent they copied African folklore and made this folklore a part of their history and the same folklore having existed in Africa for thousands of years before they arrived. Now, what you have to look at also is the fact that we are talking about a period in the history of the world when there was no such thing as Europe. It's hard for you to believe this, and it is hard for you to understand that the, for most of the existence of the world, for most of the time, man has been functioning in the world. There was no such place as Europe. Now, we're looking at civilizations that existed before the creation of a place in Western A in Northern Asia called Europe. That is not a colony. What you have to understand is the impact of the glacier age. And the glacier age hit Europe for most of the existence of these early civilizations, Europe was an ice cap and was uninhabited. It was only after the melting of this ice that people could go into Europe and form a civilization or a way of life. And these first people were African. Now, you're wondering how did they become white? Well, it's a longer story that we have to, that we can tell but nature endows man and woman 
with the covering they need for nature put them down. And nature subtracts from man and woman things that they do not need in the climate and in the environment where nature put them down or where they choose to dwell. All right, now, <laughs> Christianity developed out of African humanistic values and social thought. These humanistic values and social thought was old in Africa and remained in Africa for thousands of years before someone gave the religion a name. In other words, there was probably more Christianity before someone decided that it should have a name and they put a name on it. Now this is reflected in a lot of literature, some written by Africa by our own writers, John Jackson's Pagan Origins of the Christ Myth, where he traces the concept of Christ in 26 civilizations, all a thousand miles apart. And in another word, man, God, and civilization. In another pamphlet, the African Origins of Christianity. And his new work, only out a few months ago, Christianity before Christ. Now the unfortunate thing about a book like Christianity before Christ is that a lo lot of people will read the title, be intrigued with the title, and little afraid to read the book. And yet he has treated the subject with great delicacy and with great respect. All he has done, has done is to point out that all of the elements that ultimately went into the making of Christianity existed in Africa before Christ, and someone came along and a set of circumstances made man formulize those elements and give it a name. Now that is not disrespectful of the religion at all. It is a tracing of the origins of the religion to African sources, Nile Valley sources, mainly Ethiopia and the nations in the Nile Valley. We're not emphasizing Egypt alone because Egypt alone was not the producers of this great civilization. A complex of nations in the Nile Valley produced this civilization and produced the religion. The concept of worship and the concept of a single God of first appeared in Ethiopia. But the formalization of the concept would later appear in Egypt during the period of Afnaga. All right, now, my point is that in looking at the religion, we have to look at the history at the same time. And we have to look at some of the literature around it, especially John Jackson's uh, work, Ethiopia and the origins of civilization and the pagan origins of the Christ myth and other works, including the later work on the African origins of, of Christianity. All right. He shows also how this religion spread to India, spread to other parts of the world, and took on different names. And these deities appeared under other guys. All right, now, the formalization of these religions 
of this religion and this religion functioning side by side with other religions brought no conflict at this time in history. None of the conflict that we see today. And we see it first taking shape in Ethiopia and moving down the Nile. In the fortunate circumstance of its birth and its development before someone gave it a name, if there was no pressure or agitation about it in the setting. There was no Asian, there was no European, and the Africans wasn't fighting over it, and they granted each other the choice of choosing one aspect of it than another. But the Africans had already begun to develop the main aspect that would go into their spiritual life. An aspect that still goes into African spiritual life. If you visit, if you visit the villages, you will not see it in the city, but you will see it today in the villages. And that is bringing life in harmony with nature. And when we look at life today, life today in the Western world is out of harmony with nature. It makes no sense. It makes no sense for one man to have enough bread to feed a multitude and to hold up the multitude. It makes no sense. There's a lack of balance. But Africans had a society where each man gave and each man had according to his needs. Now this was a form of social living that predates the concept of socialism. This is what Karl Marx misunderstood, and this is what the Marxists still misunderstood, and this is what they stupidly call primitive countries. It wasn't primitive at all. It was advanced, and it was Christian. So they say religion is the opiate of the people. They can't deal and these early societies in that spirituality was a total thing. And religion wasn't the opiate of the people. Religion was part of the totality of the society and part of the day-by-day -day spirituality of the society, and it determined everything. It was only in the emptiness of Europe it was only under feudalism. It was only in the misuse of the child. It was only in this regard, the hustlerism of the European church, that they turned it into the opiate of the people. But religion was never intended to be the opiate of the people. And this is why the European has no understanding of the non-European mind, of the non-European spirituality. Right. Yeah. Yeah. These other religions were not hurriedly brought into being or hurriedly changed. They stayed in intact for years. So the basic thing about these religions was to create balance, balance in society, and a respect for the law of opposite. If you had a God, you had to have a God. Yes. 
here you had the first female equality. Here you had the first female gods of Israel. Child Hapa is the best known of the early gods because her influence spread to India and the concept of the sacred cow started from the worship of Hathor. But the greatest and the most influential of all of the female gods is Maya, who is still worshipped. Now, Europe never had a female spiritual figure. At no time did any female rise to a permanent position in the spirituality of Europe. Or Islam. I am saying that these Africans had created a society where the fear of the female mind was unknown, and where man was considered to be a balanced or unbalanced without female companionship. And where sometimes the God was depicted as being a combination of male and female. Because the totality of man, as they conceived it, consisted of me. Now, this humanistic way of looking at life and looking at people brought into being a concept that is still practiced in Africa, and that is the concept of a matrilineal society. The concept of a society where the lineage comes down to the female side of the family. And most African societies to this day are matrilineal as against patrilineal. And every invader and the last of the massive invaders who tried to change this and succeed in changing it in one part of Africa, especially the West East Coast, would be the Africans. Now we would talk about this when we talk about African rise of Islam. Then we will also deal with certain segments of the television series, The Africans, and certain basic glaring errors so smoothly told that you have a hard time accepting them as errors. Because the man that is narrating it is an absolute master. He has been at the game so long, and he is himself at that. I mean, he did not that Africa waited in darkness for his long friend to lie. And he's not the only one because I've heard it reflected right here. between history and folklore. 
Let's look at African spirituality in the years before any invader touched African soil. No invaders, no outsiders at all. We're looking at the elements created in Africa that ultimately is going to go into Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. These elements, spiritual elements, created by Africa. And finally, the coming of invaders and what they did. Now, when people say that what they did in Africa was someone said that they came to Africa and built the pyramids. <laughs> the people who said they built the pyramids arrived in the 13th dynastic period. Most of the pyramids were built between the 3rd and the 6th dynastic period. And they arrived over a thousand years later. <clears throat> if they say they built bricks without stones, there is no record in African history that bricks were ever built that way. <laughs> and there is no record where slave labor ever constructed anything as fine as what was constructed. In Africa. Now, let's deal with Hebrew myth, a dangerous thing to deal with in and out of the chapter. <laughs> All right, they came in the 1700s BC. Inasmuch as the, so much of the Bible is involved in Hebrew myth, and so much of Christianity is involved with Hebrew myth, then let us deal with Hebrew myth. They came 1700 BC, escaping famine, a bunch of hungry people. Western Asian gypsies looking for a home. They brought no spirituality to Africa. They brought nothing of substance to Africa. They came and they ate, they got the bellies full, they got land. Some of them married African women, Abraham being one of them, misused her, literally discarded her. Eighteen, sixteen, eighty, Africa was invaded by the Hitzites. What position did they take? Did they join their African friends against the first invaders of Africa? No. They joined the invaders. And they rose to high position under the foreign king. Now, I'm not dealing with fiction now. I'm dealing with fact. I'm not dealing with folklore, I'm dealing with fact. They rose to high position under the foreign king. The Hitzites called the Shepherd King. This lasted 150 years, almost 200 years. They produced the world's first dealer, dealer politician named Joseph Call the Provider. Why could he provide? because he had the ear of the then remaining king. And he could provide for his people because politically he was in track. Then, as the Bible said, Joseph dies, 
his relative died, and a king emerged, arose, who knew not Joseph. Who is the king who knew not Joseph? Now I 